All right, let's get started. So for those watching on YouTube, I'm streaming from Utah, the wilderness of Utah. I'm playing a Fisher Random Tournament here that starts tomorrow. So the day of recording is 2 a.m. March 20th, 2023. So I apologize for the low camera quality and if the audio peaks and stuff, you know, apologies for that as well. But I don't see a good reason not to do a speedrun game from here, from here. So I'll do my very best to keep the quality up. We are black against an 1875. E4. All right, let's go C5. Go C5. Knight F3, Knight C6. And hopefully we get another Accelerator Dragon. It has been impossible to get mainline Sicilians in the speed. It, it, it's amazing to me that at this level we're still facing the amount of sidelines that we're facing. But it's eye-opening because it's giving me a better understanding of what I need to teach and what kinds of videos I need to make when I get to a sort of main opening videos, which will be pr pretty soon. B4 is the wing gambit. And the wing gambit is a, I would call this a third string gambit. Let's say first string openings are main lines, like the open Sicilian and the Rosalimo. The second string gambit would be the Smith Mora. The wing gambit is a, one that has a very dubious reputation. And I would classify it as a third string gambit because white is worse with best play from black. And that's the distinction between an opening like this and something like the Smith Mora where black can equalize in many different ways, but black is certainly not better in the main lines. So the idea of before is actually very simple. It's the same as most other gambits. You're trying to force the C pawn off of the C5 square in order to be able to occupy the center with uh, the D pawn. Now, B4 in this particular version is a lot more rare than it is here. This is the delayed wing gambit, I think, because knight takes B4 is an additional possibility here. I will admit that I've never seen B4 played in this exact position. My guess would be that in response to knight takes B4, white wants to play C3, drive the knight back, and then play D4. So it doesn't seem to be sensible for us to take on b4 with the knight because that buys white a tempo that he can use to support the center with c3 if that makes sense so let's start by accepting the gambit with a pawn i hope i don't get like crushed with theory here because i will admit and i'm not even ashamed to admit this i i knew the theory of the wing gambit a long time ago in this version because i was a knight orc player i don't know anything about this particular version of it i don't know if the knight on c6 is a good thing or bad thing so we're all on our own here, and hopefully I'll give you a window into how I try to improvise when I know nothing about a particular opening. D4, as expected. First things first, we need to avoid getting blown off the board. And it seems to me that allowing D5 here is extremely unwise, because the knight will have to go back to B8. So a big mistake here would be to play knight out to F6. White would play D5, and then on the next move, E5. And the knights will be driven back to their initial spots. So I think the obvious move here is d5. Well, the, uh, the move that should be on everyone's mind is d5. But contesting the center before it's too late. And after the trade on d5, that queen cannot be attacked with the move knight c3 because our pawn is controlling that square. I think I know what our opponent is intending in response to d5, e takes d5, queen takes d5. I think it's this weird move, c2, c4, attacking the queen. And yes, I just realized that I have played this guy before. It's too late to abort, so we're just going to have to roll with it. it. I try to play different people in the speedrun, but it's fine. I mean, it's a game. Uh, it's actually a new set of challenges, so I'm more than happy to continue this game. I don't see an alternative to d5. I think we should start with that move. And then we should cross the subsequent bridge when we get there. The only other alternative that I see is the move d6. d6 is interesting because in response to d5, we can swing our knight around to e5. And if the knights are traded, then we get a pawn into the center and we kind of curb, we curb the advance of white's pawns. I actually think d6 might be a very good way to avoid mainstream theory. So I will admit that d5 is probably the best move and black is probably better there and we'll check it with the engine after the game but i'd like to avoid theory and so let's make a somewhat more modest move but one that our opponent is likely to not know as well 
if that makes sense. So you're probably looking at this and frowning and saying, well, you're a GM, you're supposed to be principled. But sometimes when you're caught unawares and you can sense that the position's incredibly sharp and your opponent likely knows theory, making a more modest move, one that you sense might be a little bit inferior, uh, can be a very good idea to force your opponent to think with their own brain. But you have to be very careful. You don't want to make a bad, flat-out bad move. So, okay, knight b8 here is not completely stupid, okay? As dumb as it looks, here's the thing. Our pawn on d6 is doing a very good job of stopping the progress of white's e-pawn, right? It also should be pointed out that white only has one piece developed, so it's not like we fall behind that much. We don't fall behind astronomically in development with knight to b8. But knight to e5 still seems more logical to me as a way of trying to get another pawn into the center, it's important to note that after the trade, bishop b5 check runs into bishop d7, so we don't lose our queen. What I'm expecting our opponent to do is knight takes e5, d takes e5, bishop d5. Actually, I'm going to click on our game history because I want to be reminded of how I beat him the first time. I'm just going to look through this game really quickly. Oh, we actually just played. Yeah, our previous game with, was with this opponent, so... I'm sure my, my YouTube editor will make a, a smooth thumbnail out of that. Bishop b2, as expected. Now, this pawn is a weakness, and we certainly shouldn't play f6. That would greatly exacerbate our uh, development disadvantage. It would prevent the knight from coming out to f6. Right now, our top priority, well, I think we have two priorities. The first one is to develop our pieces at all costs. And we need to start now, because this is where things can get out of control if we don't start developing. So can we make a developing move that creates a counter threat? Because I also don't just want to give this pawn away for free, right? Well, there is a move which checks all the boxes, and that's the simple move knight f6 because it counterattacks the e4 pawn. And our opponent probably... This is scary because if this is still theory, then I might just lose this out of the opening. But I'm going to call our opponent's bluff. I don't see specifically what he is intending in response to knight takes e4. So let's find out what grand scheme our opponent has cooked up here. From a developmental perspective, this shouldn't be that great for white because we both have one piece developed. So it's not like, you know, white has a thousand pieces out and we're getting attacked. Queen d4 is a scary looking move, but I'm not too scared of it. Again, bishop b5 check always met with bishop to d7. So let's set that aside. What does this move do? Well, it attacks the knight, and it attacks the g7 pawn. Definitely not a pawn that we want to lose, because our whole king side collapses. So to me, the move seems forced. I think we have to drop back to f6 here. Just sort of making forced... I mean, knight d6, actually... Oh, knight d6 might have been possible. I didn't see that at all. Bishop takes g7. There might be this forking move. Knight f5. Anyways, knight f6 is totally fine. c4. So our opponent is trying to shove those pawns down our throat. Wow, c4. Well, we might need to work around those pawns because we have lost the battle in the center. I don't want to go e6 here because that merely exacerbates the issue. It allows d6 and then c5, and then we have a pawn right in our grill. So let's try to keep this pawn on e7. That basically means one thing. There's only one way to develop her bishop such that the pawn remains on e7, and that's to Fianchetto with g6. Now... Are we scared of g6, bishop takes knight? Well, then we take with a pawn and the e-file opens, but white doesn't have a rook that he can stick on e1. In that resulting position, maybe c5 is scary. So it's iffy, but I don't think it's bad. I think it's actually okay. Let's go g6. Let's see what our opponent has, has in store for us here. It's slightly terrifying. And I will admit, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared of this position, but I think we'll get out of it. And in retrospect, I think d6 is a serious mistake, actually. I think I I under, I simply underestimated the, the power of white's pawns in the center. And I have to say, our opponent has been playing this incredibly. Like, c4 is a is a grandmaster level move. And probably we should have considered taking on Passat, but that would have let the knight come out of the gates. And from c3... The knight had quick access to b5 and c7. And remember, we're not even close to castling yet, so we need every tempo that we can get here. At least I've gotten him to think. So that's already a great relief.
yeah, no, on Passat was possible. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that it was possible. I think some people take on Passat by default because it's a cool move. Okay, this is a great relief. Seeing this move is like, okay, let's go Bishop G7, let's castle. And when we castle, we can start dealing with the shenanigans that are happening in the center. Another big advantage of our position is A, we're up a pawn. Let's not forget that. B, the pawn up B4 is preventing the knight from coming out. That's a pretty big problem for white. No, white can play knight d2, but you should agree that the knight on d2 is a lot less scary than it would be on c3. Now, our opponent is try still trying to go for our throat, but this is becoming less and less scary with every piece that we are developing. And g4 is music to my ears. I don't think it's scary at all because white has half of his pieces undeveloped. White's got his king in the center. I think we're going to be able to turn the tables on white in terms of who's attacking who. And I think most people, when you're looking at this move, your instinct is probably to go h6. h6 doesn't really help because white will just go h4. In fact, it will merely add kindling. I was going to say tinder for the fire. There is a wood use of the word tinder. They will add kindling to the fire because after white plays g5, right, the h file is likely to open. And the h file opening is a huge problem for us if we castle kingside, and that's the only way that we can castle. So I propose that we ignore everything our opponent is doing and just frickin' castle anyway. G5, does it win a piece? No, because we drop our knight back to E8, simultaneously defending the bishop. Now, you might look at this still. Wait a second. I've said many times over that in the Accelerated Dragon and the Grunfeld, you're not supposed to give up your dark squared bishop. Well, there's two caveats to that. The first is when you give up your bishop for your opponent's dark squared bishop, it's generally better than giving up your bishop, let's say, for a knight, because now white doesn't have the machinery to exploit the weak dark squares around our king. White lacks a dark squared bishop that otherwise would have been terrorizing us from h6, let's say. The second thing is that there are more important things in this position, right? We're deflating the pressure and the TLDR is that there are more important priorities. So we start by playing knight f5 and finally pushing this queen. The queen has to move. And ultimately, our knight has access to the d4 square. Now, what are we trying to avoid in this position? What is the source of danger? Well, there really is none. There aren't a lot of sources of danger here because even if white plays h5, what is white going to do next? Even if white plays h6, the knight from f5 controls the mating square on g7, and 2 tempi is an eternity in this position. So a lot depends on where our opponent puts his, his queen. But long story short, we're out of the woods completely. Not literally, because I am in the woods right now as I'm broadcasting the stream. All right, queen f4. So what do we want to achieve in this position? Well, what was our goal when we set out to get out of the the tizzy that we found ourselves in at the opening. Well, it was ultimately to get rid of white's control over the center. It's taken us 16 moves, but I, th I think we're finally in a position where we can get rid of the vestiges of white's initiative in the center. And the reason is that I'm, is because I'm not scared of the move H5, which means that we have a tempo that we can spend on whatever it is we want to spend it on. And what I'd like to spend it on is just getting rid of white's central control because once the center opens, white's king is caught in the crossfire, especially if we can open the e-file. So what move am I constantly hinting at here? Well, b5 is b5 is a great move, I think. b5 chips away at the center from the base. We can also chip away at it from the tip, which I think is just more straightforward. The move e6. Why is it more straightforward? Because it applies even more immediate pressure on white center. Bishop f3. Okay. So now I think we have quite a menu of good options. We can play e takes d5 and then throw in a check on e8 and then get rid of that bishop by bringing our own bishop out to e6. That looks like a simple and incredibly powerful continuation. I'm not even going to think twice about the other options. Simple, simple chess. And I think some of you might look at this and say, well, the bishop on d5 is super active. This is where concrete thinking comes in, because I notice that after I check on e8, our bishop comes out to e6, and the bishop on d5 is totally destabilized. It won't be able to remain there. White's king is wide open. This game is 
not over, and I was going to say CD is the correct move by our opponent. So first things first, I'm going to throw in this check because it's not going to hurt. Okay, throwing in this check, driving the king to a more vulnerable spot is not going to hurt. What do, again, what do we want to achieve here? Well, I don't think that we should go for checkmate. I mean, a move like queen e7 might be very tempting, but remember, white can bring the knight out to d2, and the e1 square is going to be controlled. I think we should complete our development, right? It's important not to forget that we still haven't developed our bishop, and it'll be hard to play in the long run without the services of our bishop and our rook. So the move is quite obvious when you put it in that way. It's not bishop d7, because that's an awkward move. I want to do two things at once. I want to develop, and I want to tackle the last remaining annoyance in the position, which is this pesky pawn on d5. So we combine these observations, and we play b6, we fianchetto the other bishop. Now, am I not afraid of d6 here? Well, d6 is one move itis. That's just a one-move threat, and if you move the rook to b8, big deal. That pawn on d6 is surrounded like a wood cabin from all sides. And we're just going to take it with our queen or our knight. Thank you, uh, queen takes b4. I will admit, in full disclosure, I did blunder that pawn. <laughs> I did not see that that was hanging. It's uh, pretty late at night. But I don't think it changes anything. I don't think it changes all that much. That pawn was not very important anyway, right? Who cares? Who cares about pawns? Yeah, we're just going to continue as, the, as though nothing is the matter. I'm just going to play bishop b7. In all seriousness, that was an important pawn. That pawn was doing exactly one thing, but it was doing a very important thing. It was preventing white from playing knight c3. So apologies, that might have been the biggest mistake I've made so far in the speed run. There is a silver lining to us blundering the pawn, which is that we now have another tempo that we can use to accumulate the pressure. And when I say accumulate the pressure, what I normally mean is like bringing pieces into the game and literally making contact with our opponent's pieces. And I see a good way to do that, which is rook to c8, bringing our last remaining piece into the game and putting pressure on the knight. And you, you'll hear this term a lot in chess commentary, putting pressure, putting pressure. That translation of that is just like contact between your piece and your opponent's piece. But notice I'm not saying you're threatening your opponent's piece. A lot of people confuse these two concepts. When you're threatening a piece, you're going to capture it. If you're, make, if you're putting pressure on it, we were just making contact with it. Knight e4 is a great move by our opponent. Oh, let me think about this. Some very complicated tactics here. Okay. We can sack our queen. It's kind of interesting, actually. Bishop a6, king g2. I have to calculate some stuff. Some detail there that I missed. Ugh. Ooh. Oh my gosh, I see a beautiful line. Okay, because we're low on time, I'm just going to make these moves, and then I'm going to explain them properly after the game. We're going to start with a check on a6. We're setting up... What are we setting up? We're setting up the move rook c4. Obviously, knight f6 check is a huge threat. And you might say, well, why shouldn't we just move our king? The problem is if we move our king into the corner, the white queen is going to check it along the diagonal. See, we're paying the price for giving up our dark squared bishop. That's the price that you pay. And then our king is going to be driven back to g8 where it will be forked. And the fork might not even be the biggest problem. The biggest problem is going to be the lack of uh, protection around the king. We're just going to get mated. So now we play rook c4. But all of this hinges on a detail that's incredibly easy to miss. And these are the tactical details that you have to see if you want to be 18, 1900, 2000. What detail am I talking about? Who can tell me the crucial line which allows rook c4 to work? Work in quotation marks. It's it's still not clean, but I think it, it'll give us a big attack. Yeah, so if white throws in the intermediate check on f6, we have queen takes f6. Simultaneously, we are attacking white's queen, and we're attacking the rook in the corner, which is actually very important. Because white has the counter desperado, queen takes rook. And in response to that, if we were to simply take the queen, white would take our queen and we would be down in exchange, right? Because white has eliminated a rook and we've only taken the knight on f6. Yeah, so white probably should have played king g2, 
because then, okay, the line gets very complicated. We'll talk about that after the game. What I missed from a distance is not this move, although I also missed this move. This move, I think, is bad. I think I think our opponent is starting to slip. At this point, we need to abandon material considerations, and we need to go directly for checkmate. What is surrounding the White King? What is the protection of the White King? Well, it's really the two minor pieces. The two minor pieces are what's preventing our knight and our rooks and our queen from just infiltrating the wide open king side. And the king side is wide open because these pawns are no longer affording the king even the shred of protection. So what do we do? We make a move basically intuitively, even though it is a sacrifice, technically it's a sacrifice. I don't really think of it as a sacrifice. We just eliminate the knight on our own terms. And now we eliminate the bishop on our own terms. Why is it a sacrifice? Well, because presumably our opponent is going to take our bishop. And if he survives that resulting position, then he deserves to win this game. So queen takes a6 is what I'm expecting. And then we have to think very carefully about how we want to conduct our attack. So the obvious move to me is queen takes pawn because that sort of involves the queen. And it sets up the threat of rook e4 to g4 check. Now, we could also play rook g4 check straight away. If the king moves to the h file, then we can take on h4 with check and then take on g5 and we win. The issue is that the king will run the other way, king f1. Then we can take on d5. And we need to understand whether the inclusion of this additional check actually benefits us. I think the answer is no. But let me think about this for a second. There are some actually very, very complex, complex lines here. So we could also, by the way, play knight takes h4. That's another possibility. And this one I would not discount, knight takes h4. But then the king runs the other way, king f1. I don't like that. I think we should probably go like this. Rook h3, there's always rook g4. Or we could throw in the check. It's v it, See, I, I have no idea what the right answer is. This is. This is a very high degree of difficulty kind of situation. I'm going to throw in the check. I am going to throw in the check, and I, there's one consideration that prevailed. I'll show you guys this line after the game. It's a super cool line. Assuming that our opponent doesn't blunder into it. Okay, now we take. Now we take. We're hitting the rook. Okay, we're hitting the rook. And what else are we doing? Well, we're, we have a lot of these sort of tactical threats. Like, there, you might notice, like, 93 check. And if the F pawn moves away, there's a check on F3. So your your spidey sense should be tingling. But there's a very important observation I should make in this position, which is that you shouldn't think of this as, okay, either our attack succeeds or we lose the game. Only down a tiny bit of material. And this is honestly very disappointing. It's disappointing that our opponent just collapses like this. It's common for that to happen at this level. Okay, our opponent just blunders queen g2 check, which is pretty anticlimactic. Yeah, we win the rook and we win the game easily because all white has is queen c8 check. And that's a pathetic, that's a pathetic check because we just move our king up to g7. And that's game over because we're also controlling the c3. As if we needed that, we're also controlling the c3 square. So check, king up, queen c3 check. We're controlling it. And even if we weren't controlling it, we could block that check on d4, which is what we would have had to do uh, a couple of moves earlier if our opponent had actually tried to defend this position properly. Yeah, that peak will definitely be edited out of the, the final YouTube video. Yeah, those watching on YouTube, my mic apparently just went nuts and knocked everyone's ears out. But you won't hear that because of the magical editing work. Okay, our opponent is like, this is what I would call pinching a dinosaur, where we're like checkmating on the king side. Our opponent is busy like gobbling up grains of rice on the queen side. This is, at this point, we could just focus our attention on the king. And essentially any check is going to be checkmate, but there is an art. There is an art to checkmating the king in these types of positions. And I will say that a lot of people struggle. Perhaps you will identify yourself among this number. A lot of people struggle with this final stage of actually checkmating the king. So what I just said about any check working, that actually is not really true. In this position, there are two obvious checks. 
there is knight f5 to d4. There is rook g4 to e4. What you want to avoid is a situation where your pieces are basically stumbling over each other. And that situation occurs after knight d4 check. Because if you look at the position after king to d2, what you want to do there is deliver a check on d4 with the rook in order to set up some sort of a ladder mate construction. But you can't do that because your knight is in the way. So you might say, well, knight d4 check, king d2, let's go knight f3 check. But what's the drawback of that move? Well, then your queen is blocked from the third rank. So you don't want that either. So it's important to actually start with a rookie four check, drive the king to the D file, deliver another check on D4 with the rook. The knight is actually extraneous. The knight isn't really a necessary attacking piece in this particular version of events. So now we check the king again and notice how the rook and the queen are combining here. If the king moves to C2, queen D3 is going to be checkmate in a couple of moves. If the king dips back to E1, then we've got a lot of options. We can win the rook with queen h1. We can win the rook with queen c3. And we'll probably do one of those things. And there, I'm sure there's forced mate there as well. And this is why earlier today I had a lesson with Botez. And I recommended a chessable course that's called a th it's like a 1,121 mates. I'll link it in the description to the YouTube video. And it's like 600 maiden twos. 500 maiden threes and like 400 maiden fours. It's like the easiest way to develop your ability to find checkmates quickly because this is one of those things that literally can only be attained through practice. There is no logical process to detecting mating patterns. You just got to freaking do it. So what's the fastest mate here? Well, there's maiden three. Queen d2, rook b4, and queen c3. Or the simpler one is actually just to give a check with a rook then to deliver... Um, actually, no, I, I went for the longer mate by accident, but it's fine. Doesn't matter. As long as you see the mate, it doesn't... Who's who's counting, right? Rook c4. And let's deliver the latter mate. Yeah, so unfortunately, that was a very anticlimactic attack. This could have been very juicy. And I will admit, I missed quite a few moves in this game. I'll chalk up partially to the hour and to the fact that I was at a five-hour flight today. But I think this made the game more interesting and it made it more realistic. And the point of the speedrun is not for me to show how perfect I am. It's actually the opposite, right? You To expose all the imperfections. Let's start by analyzing the opening because this is quite important. And this is something you are likely to face, like not often, but once in a while, and you should know how to play against it. Also, somebody in the chat said that the wing gamut is the reason that they don't play the Sicilian. So we definitely want to tackle this uh, properly. So let me pull up chess base and let's fire up the beast. Let's fire up stockfish and let's see what stockfish has to, has to tell us uh, as well as the reference about, about the wing gambit. So it appears to me, I've just fired up stockfish. I'm going to let it sit for a moment in terms of what people actually do. Now C takes before is by far more popular, which is probably why we should go for knight takes before. Huh? Yeah, I actually think Stockfish tends to prefer knight takes before, at least in the early going of its calculation. So what's happening after knight takes before? White plays c3. That's the only logical move. We drop our knight back to c6, and white plays d4. So this position occurs. And notice the difference between this position and, like, this position, which is a subtle difference, right? Here the pawn is shifted to b4. And there are pluses and minuses associated with that. So let's consider this other version. How does the engine propose to play here? Well, it proposes to play in a way that nobody plays. The most popular move here is actually d5, which apparently allows white to equalize. The computer line is cdcd. C, D, and actually this kind of weird looking move e6. Okay, so who can tell me why our intuition is against the move e6? e6 looks like it... I don't want to say loses, but it looks like it runs right into a super nasty move. Turns out that this super nasty move loses on the spot for white. So you're going to have a badass way to meet the wing gambit. You're going to have a badass way to meet the wing gambit. My computer is making, is making sounds, folks. Because I'm running Stockfish. Yeah, D5. D5 is very annoying. Because our knight is driven away, and this is exactly what I said we had to avoid. 
it's actually winning for black. Who can spot? And if you're watching on YouTube, you should pause. What is black's winning move in this position? Yeah, I, I ran stockfish on my chest base, so that's why it was that's why it was laboring. Yeah, queen f6. Queen f6 wins for black. Because the rook in the corner is literally trapped. And this is a category of traps that you should be intimately familiar with. They occur across all openings. Like the most famous instantiation is actually probably the queen's gambit. And the queen's gambit accepted. There's a very famous line that's been known since the 1600s where white goes e3. Black supports the pawn of b5. White chips away at it. Black defends. White trades. And white traps the rook with queen f3. In general, something that's not talked about a lot is how the rook in the corner is an incredibly vulnerable piece. And when the when the center opens up, you should always be aware of ideas that end up hitting the rook in the corner because sometimes you just don't have the machinery to deal with that. So we compare this to this position, which is basically identical. White has to take the knight. And this pawn looks very scary, but whichever way it takes, the bishop just recaptures. And most importantly... Most importantly, white has no way to trap the queen in the corner because I'm sure you've seen lines where, you know, white has a bunch of pieces developed and your queen gets trapped with like bishop b2, right? So let's say white plays like this, black plays like this. White White's top engine move is queen b3. Now black is supposed to develop the rook to c8, hitting the bishop. If bishop b2, then the knight is lost. So white has to burn a tempo playing a move like bishop to d2. Now the engine on chess.com likes knight to e7, which I think is totally reasonable. Ah, and the idea is very simple. You're actually heading for d4. Notice how you're keeping your queen on a1. Now, finally, white has a threat here. And the reason white didn't have this before, bishop c3 seems to trap the queen, but black has a beautiful tactic that defends against it. Who can spot it? There's a lot of tactics in this opening. Bishop b4. So you're counterpinning the bishop. And you might say, well, then white's going to take the bishop. But if you calculate all the way to the end, you have a check on c1. And you pick up the rook in the corner. So very nice. Zen madman got it. So th this tactic is the reason why you bring the knight to c6 to support the b4 square. But the secondary reason is to play this move knight d4. And finally, white is basically forced to take. The queen is evacuated, and black is up a full exchange and a pawn, and white has nothing to show for it. So where? how did we get here? So the important th moves to remember are e6, d5, and queen f6. This is basically all you have to remember. The other moves are pretty intuitive. Um, if c takes b7, well, the engine likes the idea of throwing in a check, uh, which is... You can do that. You can also just take on b7, and you're completely winning. Okay, bishop b5. You just develop your knight and defend against checkmate. And white's probably just going to go like this. Oh, no, but now the knight is saying. So, no, this is just a disaster. This is just a disaster. Um, If white plays e5 here, then you play knight takes e5. And the problem is that you still are aiming at the rook, and you're threatening... Well, you're threatening just to take white's knight, and then to take the rook. And if white, like Fianchetto's... Notice that no squares along this diagonal are defended. So you're just going to end up losing the bishop and then the rook. If white plays queen d4, you're going to end up losing your queen. Probably the most resilient is knight d4. But now we apply pressure on the knight with bishop c5. White's going to defend. And according to the engine, you just develop your pieces. Because you're already up a pawn. And you've got just like amazing pieces. And amazing pieces in the center. And it's plus six here. This position is only a pawn down for white, but it's plus six. Oh, and there's a reason why. There's a winning move in this position. Let's see who can find it. Black to play and win a ton of material in this position. Yeah, minus six, minus eight. Big numbers. Big numbers here. Knight c6. Yeah, knight c6. Yeah, it's up to minus 7.25. Yeah, this is this is enough. Uh, for us to convert queen f2 queen b2 and white is just massacred everywhere no pieces developed takes apparently the best move is actually bishop takes f2 the idea being to drive the king up to d2 so you could take with check if the king goes the other way you have a check here 
and you pick up the bishop and then pick up everything else. There's other winning moves, but this is the simplest. So what we have figured out, and I don't think there are any other moves in this position. White could try this. Oh, this is important. This move is very clever because if you grab the knight, then white develops the bishop with tempo. More importantly, white connects the rook and the queen. And then white recaptures c6. And you're going to be up a pawn. But black is a much better move. Bishop b4 wins the game here. Because now if white takes, then you take with a bishop and you win the rook. If white plays bishop d2, again, you take the bishop. Sorry, you take the knight and you hit the rook in the corner. So you actually emerge up a piece. Um, the salt giant asks a very illuminating question. In the line that we just considered, so let me play through that again. e5, knight takes e5. Um, what were we looking at? Knight d4, bishop c5, bishop e3, I think. No, bishop b2. Here, white took. Is it the same thing if we put the other knight on c7? Uh, basically, yes, yes. You can put the other knight on c7. The only reason we stepped back with this knight it was in order to increase the number of attackers on the knight on d4. So it's a little bit better. So hopefully this makes sense to everybody. That's not the end of the analysis because, of course, white's best move is to avoid d5. But the good news, folks, is that d5 is the most popular move in the database. And Christopher Yu, the Grandmaster, in a rapid game against Pragnananda, he actually played d5 here and he lost the game after queen f6. So Christopher Yu played the move queen b3 here. Pragnananda took. And this wasn't like a blitz game. This was a rapid game. Christopher played e5 which is also how a lot of people play this. And here the best move is hard to find. It's a5, and Pragnanada played it. Well, you're trying to go a4 and dislodge the queen from b3 so that you could like get your own queen out eventually. Christopher played bishop d3. Pragnanada played a4, driving the queen back, which apparently is inaccurate. According to the engine, bishop to b4 check is an improvement. Let's say white steps up. And now black has an amazing idea. C5. No way. Now this looks like it loses the queen self-evidently. But again, black has one of those moves that counterattacks white's queen. And by forcing the queen away from b3, black carves out an escape route for his own queen. If queen c4, then the bishop is lost. If the queen goes the other way, you take the pawn. And you run away through b3. Now, at your level, I don't think anybody's going to play all these moves with white. These are like super high-level defensive moves. But you'll still know how to deal with them. If white covers with a bishop, then you just take the bishop. And again, you play a4. And the point of moving the queen away from c2 is so that you can occupy... Sorry, b3. You can occupy the b-file with your rook. And the point of that is to create an escape square for your queen. Queen b2 is coming next. Actually, here you take the rook. So why can't even can't even move the knight? It's hard to see. I mean, a5 here is a very hard move to come up with if you don't know anything about the position. Yeah, a5, just going down the side of the board. But hopefully you understand the logic. It's a two-idea move. The first is to create an anchor point for the bishop. The second is to drive the pawn down to force the queen off of b3 to allow your rook to get to b8 to enable the queen ultimately to escape through b2. Okay, so that's enough on d5. If white plays this more conventionally and plays knight to c3, which is, I think, the only other move that you're going to face, then apparently, let me turn on Stockfish again. Okay, we can use the chess.com engine, but that's not ideal. I will turn on Stockfish, so my computer will start worrying for a little bit longer. Okay, so apparently the best move here is bishop b4, bishop d2, knight f6, which makes sense. You just develop your freaking pieces. You just develop your pieces. And if white plays bishop to d3, which is the top computer move, if white plays d5 here, then black wins by taking the knight and taking the pawn. Lots of tactics here related to undefended pieces. Because white moved the pawn away from b2. Bishop g7, there is check. And now just rook g8, counterattacking the bishop. Black is winning. So that's not satisfactory. And if white plays bishop to d3, then black plays d6. I like d6. Because that keeps the options open in the center. d6. It also stops e5. And white has insufficient compensation for the pawn. It's about 0.5. So the wing gamut is really not that bad. It's not that bad. I, I didn't realize that it was better than 
its reputation is. There was a there was a game here that continued rook b1. And according to the engine, the best move is to support the bishop with the move a5. And then you basically want to play e5 and contest the center. Black is better. No question that black is better here. White is insufficient compensation. Queen c2, you can strike at the center with e5, and you can slowly and calmly move the knight back to b8, no problem, because the center is now closed. Your bishop's going to come out. Your knight's going to re redeploy through a6 to c5. And uh, I think black is doing great here. So the novelty, by the way, is a5. There is still a game in the database here. Black played bishop a5. But I like a5 a lot more because it cements the bishop with a pawn. Um, note that, okay, here if white plays e5, then it it creates a, a big weakness. I mean, these two light squares are really weak. So black could actually take and go knight e5. But the engine likes knight to e4, which is less intuitive because the knight isn't defended here. But in this position, you have this check on a5. And it's stronger because after knight d2, black is pressuring this square with more pieces. Now this move is very strong. And knight to c3, wow. And at the end of the day, you're going to win the d4 pawn. So many cool lines in, in the wing gambit here that we're exploring. But hopefully you're getting a hang of how to play this. The... TLDR is that the best way to play this, at least according to this like very amateurish analysis, is to take with a knight, to drop back, and then to not play the move d5 here. That's the key temptation to avoid. And by the way, the reason you don't play d5 here is because it's like a Scandi where your queen gets tossed around and white has the possibility of playing d5. Mantra Frost says, I don't understand. So if you can break down your lack of understanding into a specific question, like at which point did I lose you? Then I'll be able to repeat it or phrase something in another way. Um, so as long as you remember that, you'll remember to play e6 and you'll remember that queen to f6 is the key idea in response to d5. If white plays knight c3, then we bring our bishop out with tempo, we bring our knight out, and we actually put the d-pawn on d6 rather than d5, which allows a kind of French advance structure that we're trying to avoid because we could get Greek gifted. You understand why, why you don't play d5 here? It's because this is a structure you're trying to avoid, and the reason you're trying to avoid it is because it's very hard to castle in these types of positions because there's always going to be a Greek gift sacrifice. So what... How does it help for us to play d6? Well, we're preventing e5. How are we preventing e5? Because here we can take the pawn. Why can we take the pawn? Because if white takes back, he loses the bishop on d3. Yeah, white recaptures the knight, but in this particular position, he loses the knight on c3. But even if he didn't, we could just recapture on f6 and be winning. Okay? And you're trying to permanently prevent white from playing e5 by ourselves playing e5, Rui Lopez style, later in the game. There are other moves other than knight c3. Like, for example, white could play here immediately. But your style of play is going to be the same. I think a check here would be a good idea. Maybe white can play like this. But I, th I think you could just play knight f6 anyway. And ultimately, if white doesn't play knight c3, well, you just keep playing d6. You know, eventually white's going to have to develop the knight. And you certainly don't mind a trade of dark squared bishops. Not at all. This check, you just go back to c6 and we're chilling. Okay, so anyways, that's enough in the opening. Our strategy was to take, and here definitely, what's funny is the engine doesn't think black is better after d5. I was right. My intuition told me to stay the heck away from this position. This position already seems very bad to me practically, because if you move the queen, you run into d5. If you take on Passant, you get a Scandi-style position where this knight on c6 is an incredibly vulnerable piece. By the way, what other opening do we see something very similar happen in? And we have this opening a lot in the speedrun. What comparison can we draw? In fact, we get almost exactly the same types of sequences in that opening. Who can think what I'm talking about? We had a game just like this. It's a Sicilian. It's a type of Sicilian. It's an Alpin. In the Alpin with d5, if black misplays it, then we get almost identical sequences. Now, the difference is that white doesn't sack a pawn. But for example, if black just nonchalantly develops his knights, white plays knight c3. We had a game like this. And once the queen moves, 
it's literally like an identical position. The knight is pushed away. The pawn on d5 like lords over black's position. Here black loses the knight. So you can see how similar this would be uh, in the event that we would move the queen. It's exactly the same, the same stuff. It's almost the same position. It's even worse for black because the knight isn't even on f6. Now, the improving factor is that we can play, no, not this move, we can play queen a5. And the difference is that white lacks the b2 pawn versus the alipin. So we can buy ourselves a tempo. But after bishop d2, who wants to play this position? I mean, the queen's vulnerable, d5's a threat. The engine gives e6 and says black is fine, but d5 is still possible. And look at white's development advantage here. I mean, knight takes d5 as a threat. It's a disaster. So stay the heck away from lines like these. That's why I played d6. But probably it was a better idea to play e6 anyway. I simply did not know this idea. Queen f6 slipped my mind completely. So we decided to push the other center pawn. And after d5, I think black is already quite a bit worse. At least practically speaking. According to the engine, this position is still approximately equal. But I think it's incredibly hard to play. Any questions up to this point? And please don't feel shy. Like anything that we analyzed, hopefully I made some degree of sense when showing these variations. Okay. Yeah, D5 is the classic advice, right? Meet all the gambits with D5, but no, that's wrong. Uh, knight takes before is best, as we just kind of analyzed. Okay, sorry, I had to refresh because I, I got disconnected. Okay, so knight E5. Takes, takes, bishop b2, knight f6. This all makes sense. Bishop takes e5 is correct. Knight takes e4 and queen d4. Our opponent plays amazing in this stretch. I didn't really see queen d I mean, I saw queen d4. And at this point, it dawned on me that, like, we're worse. Like, I, we need to get our pieces out or we're going to get steamrolled. So we have a couple of questions. This opening is called the wing gambit or the delayed wing gamut the classic wing gamut is b4 in this position we will not analyze this today uh, because we have enough to look at in the deferred wing gamut um mason asks oh yes so mason asks in the position where uh, so in the line that we were analyzing boom 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 i think mason is referring to the position if white plays here black plays here white plays here black plays here castles d6 so there was a question, doesn't uh, white win the knight with d5? No. Count the defenders and the attackers. Black has two defenders on that square. White has only one attacker, so you can just take twice. And if white delivers a check on e4, then the bishop can come out and simultaneously guard the knight. Or, or we could block it with the knight, but it's a better idea to do this while developing. Okay. Um, so on we go to the game continuation. Let's go back to... This moment, queen d4, knight f6. And so we decided to play g6. Again, e6 runs into d6. And I don't want to analyze this any further because every single person should understand why this is a problem. Because we can't we can't get anything out. And white's going to support the pawn with c5. Okay, so we decided to play g6. Here, I was terrified of the move c5. This is the move that I think was white's biggest chance to get a big advantage. And I think after c5, we are in serious trouble. We're in serious trouble. The, the issue that our, our opponent just played too slowly. Just too slowly. Our opponent let us develop our pieces and then played this very bad move, which just allowed us to bring all of our pieces out at no cost. It convert, in fact, our opponent made weaknesses in his own territory. So this was very counterproductive. Why is c5 a good move? Well, what does c5 achieve? Well, it achieves a couple of things. Obviously, it, it opens up a pathway for the light squared bishop to jump into b5. But mainly, just advancing the pawns can be incredibly dangerous because black's control over the center is extremely limited. So I would have played here. Now white delivers a check. And there is a detail that I missed from a distance, which is that if we play the move that we were relying on for the whole game, which is bishop d7, who can tell me what the flaw is of this move in this particular version. And it's an easy move. You should see this quickly. C6, yeah, C6. C6, B, C, D, C. And you lose your bishop. Because if you move your bishop, you lose your queen to a discovered check. And you might say, ah, what I can block. No, but the bishop's guarding that square. So either you lose your queen to pawn takes D8 or bishop takes D7. Choose your pick. 
So, of course, if we reach this position, we'd have to, like, castle and give up a full bishop and we can resign. So, that, what does that mean? That means black has to move the king. Ugh. Ugh. This is disgusting. Now, the entrant gives the move bishop back to c4, which makes perfect sense to me. You have to solidify the d5 pawn. If white falls asleep, queen takes d5 is possible. And you might say, ah, but I can remove the defender. No, because I take the queen. And at the end of the day, the rook is actually trapped. Not that that matters. So white maintains the tension with bishop c4. It's plus 1.3. But you can understand why, because black can barely move. Okay, we can develop our bishop, but it's just an incredible position for white. Rook d1, white at some point will play the move a3. Why would white play a3? In order to free up the knight, so that the knight can join society. Uh, and it wants to join society because ultimately white's going to threaten the move like d6. But hopefully when you look at this position, it, it makes intuitive sense that even though black is technically up a pawn, white is like borderline winning here. If white played this perfectly, yeah, white would win. That's what I'm saying. A clear advantage basically means with perfect play, it is winning most of the time for the side of the clear advantage. Okay, so c5, that was the key. Bishop takes f6 would have been a very bad move because this would have conceded control of all of the dark squares. And most importantly, c5 now would run into what move? Who can spot the flaw in taking on f6 first and then playing c5? And you should like understand anytime there's a capture, you have to understand what squares are now accessible to your pieces. You have to keep updating your perception of the board. Yeah. If you do that, you spot queen e7 check immediately because previously that square was inaccessible. It was occupied by pawn. The moment the pawn moves away, you're like, oh, I now have a check on e7. Well, what does this check do? Well, it wins the c5 pawn. White can take this one. But after rook g8, white is in huge trouble because bishop to g7 is totally unstoppable. It's unstoppable. Castles, bishop g7, goodbye. The rook is lost. So... In any case, c5, that was the only way for white to maintain a big advantage. Instead, bishop e2 is a major step in the wrong direction. I still think white is better. According to the engine, if white simply castles and plays the move a3, liberating the knight, white is still better. b8, knight takes a3, the knight's coming in. Look at white's control over the center. So really, the culprit was g4. This was... I would even go so far as to say almost the decisive mistake. Um, and it's a sensible move from a conceptual standpoint. It's it's normal to drive the pawn down to g5 like this. The, the problem is that it makes too many weaknesses. And it's way too steep of a price to pay uh, to abandon your development, abandon your center, get rid of your own incredibly strong dark square bishop, and all of this for what, right? So I don't I don't want to overexplain this. I think it's clear why g4 is a huge mistake. And once this happens, okay, white can play c5 now. Congrats. At this point, it's totally empty. And black has plenty of ways to work around white center. Even the move 96 here is possible. This just shows you how big of a difference the last couple moves have made. Can't take because your queen is lost. Guess what? You're going to lose g5. You're going to lose c5. Your position's collapsing. Apparently, the move b5 is very strong here. On passant, bishop b7. Just a way of fiendkettoing the bishop with tempo. And black's pieces storm in, rook c8, etc. b5 is a nasty move. Bang, bang. Oops, sorry, no. Queen takes d5. Wow, look at b5. b5, deflection, but also a developing move. Fiendketto on steroids. Anyways, our opponent continues his campaign. We get our knight into the center. We blast open the center. We blast open the center. Now, there was a very interesting positional alternative here, and I really feel bad that I dismissed it because I think I was a little bit too stubborn. I think e takes d5 maintains the decisive advantage. But who can spot a more positional piece placement oriented approach to trying to win this position? What is the alternative to e takes d5? And it's not like rookie eight is also possible. But I'm talking about a fundamentally different way of treating this position. No, queen d6 is too much, too much Russian schoolboy. Why would you trade queen? Look at white's king. 
you, you still ultimately, ultimately you want to get to white's king. Okay, so queen a5 is one move itis. You're attracted by the threat of b3, but you're allowing white to escape. So nobody has said it yet, actually. This is really interesting. Oh, ips10 got it. e5. And I told, well, didn't you just say that you're trying to open up? Isn't the whole point of this position to open up the center? Now you're closing it down. So as I was saying, just because something has a clear minus doesn't mean you have to bury it. The queen has to move. What is the idea of e5? It's to stick the knight on this incredible, incredible square on d4. Once this knight reaches d4, the game is over. Bishop moves away. We can even chip away at the king side with f6, so we still can open up the position. But look at the domination that you are exerting on white's position. And... As a follow-up, you can still chip away at this pawn chain. It's just you can't do it with e6. But I already pointed out the other way in which we can do it. We can do it from the other direction with the move b5. We can fly through a different airport. If white plays a3, we could just stick b5 right in white's grill. And the game is over. White's losing these pawns. And the queen's coming in. It's just it's so one-sided here. So I somehow forgot that after we play e5, we'll still be able to shatter white center with a well-timed b7, b5. I got very fixated on the prospect of opening up the e-file, and I think this made our task a little bit more difficult. And b6 was obviously a an oversight. I still think it might be the best move. But somewhere around here, I might have messed up a little bit. So bishop b7... Yes, yeah, Sweet Drop says, is it also a good outpost because it is hard to trade the Black Knight with the White Knight? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Um, the Knight on D4 is what in Russian we call an eternal Knight. It's like almost impossible for White to even get to the Knight. Now, according to the engine, after E5, the best move is Queen to H2. And White has to find the ridiculously computerish Knight to D2. The Knight is so good that the engine is with the engine is willing to sacrifice an entire exchange for it. And it's, the evaluation here is minus three. So black is still completely winning. Um, but which human would ever do that, right? Um, which, which human would ever do that? Um, a human would play bishop e4 and lose after bishop f5 because you can't take two to the fork. Now, in reality, a human wouldn't play queen h2. A human move here is either queen d2 or something like queen c1. And in both cases, the eval is like minus five because of this move b5. Does that make sense to everyone? I know I broke off there for a bit, uh, but but hopefully the logic makes sense. This is a great lesson for me. I got fixated on one particular idea. And I didn't give the other ideas a chance. Anyways, I blundered b4, and then I underestimated 94. And it is a miracle that we have bishop a6 and rook c4, because otherwise, white is much better. I'm, I'm checking with the engine, and Bishop a6, rook c4 is minus 2. But um, if we don't have this, then white is border, borderline winning because well, you can't stop knight f6 otherwise. Now, I have a very interesting question for you guys. Let's say that you didn't have bishop a6 and rook c4. What would be the lesser evil? How would you deal with the threat of knight f6? Because there is a move that gives black very good practical chances due to the power of black's minor pieces and the weakness of white's king. Yeah, it's rook takes knight. So in the absence of bishop a6, I would absolutely sacrifice the exchange on e4. This is infinitely better than allowing a check on f6. I think a lot of people might play a move like this, okay? But once you allow a check on f6, suddenly, remember these things? They're called pawns. White plays h5, we're checkmated. So... What was once a ghost town becomes a booming city, and Black's king is caught in the crossfire. The game is over. Now we should probably go here. Now the engine gives queen b2 winning for black, uh, winning for white, because look at this x-ray. We can defend the, queen, the, the rook, but not forever. It's going to be lost. And black can't even get an exchange for it because of, uh, I'm sorry, rook e1. Too many attackers on the rook. And if you play f6, black takes with, white, white takes with check and then wins the rook. So such is the power of a knight on an outpost. And so a good lesson is that even if we didn't have bishop a6, I think we would get a lot of chances in a position like this. He could play rook c5. 
And it's anybody's game because the knight is so powerful. Anyways, we did have bishop a6, rook c4. And what this hinges on is the fact that if white drops back, then we get two pieces for a rook and we're completely winning. Of course, I think our opponent makes probably the decisive mistake with queen a3 because in this resulting position, and I actually played the correct move and I stand corrected, there was no defense here. It's minus 10. Of course, a more resilient defense in this position would have been what? Our opponent played rook h3, blundering this, and we can stop here. How would you guys defend here with white? What can you propose here? And then we'll go back for a second and consider the more resilient move. So there, there's a couple of options here. There's rook g1. What else can you guys name? Queen e2 blunders the rook with checkmate. Rook h3 is what our opponent played. It blunders queen g2. There are other moves here that should be considered. Consider the prospect of counterattacking. Yeah, you can throw in a couple of checks in order to bring the queen closer to the defense. This is what I'd like to start with. Here I calculated knight d4. And this position is actually not that clear unless you see the checkmate. From a distance, I had to spot this diagonal check on b5. And of course, once you see it, it's obviously made in two. But I, at first, I didn't see it. And I thought, oh, takes, takes, fork. No, because the knight is pinned. So you have to see queen b5. So that's ruled out. Rook g1 is the other resilient move. And here, the best move is incredibly hard to find. I'll give you guys a chance. If you're watching on YouTube, this is a great chance for you to build up your attacking skill. The best move, the move that wins most cleanly, is, in my opinion, it, it's, it's easy to see this move, but it's hard to appreciate why it's so good. So a lot of you are spotting knight e3. Unfortunately, this is inaccurate. If you tank, then this is checkmate, but white can run toward the center, king e2. And suddenly, black is in some trouble because you don't have any... The knight is helpless on e3. When the knight is at close quarters with the king, it's actually on its worst possible spot. The correct move is rook g4 to c4. There are two main reasons. You're preventing queen c8, so there's a prophylactic component. But the main thing is that you're preparing this devastating check on d3. You're cutting off the queen's connection to d3. White has to go here, and now you reveal a third, a third concept behind rook c4, which is to set up a discovered check against the white king. By doing so, you're forcing white's king in one of two directions. If it goes into the center, this is obviously checkmate. Check, check, and mate. This is easy. Okay? If the king goes the other way, then checkmate is waiting for the king via rook g4 check. And then you can, for example, bring the queen in and bring the queen in a little bit further. And this is just going to be, wow, you can staircase your way to checkmate. And ultimately, you're going to mate the king. I'm showing this fast because there's a thousand ways to win this position. You could take on h4, go rook h2. I'm just going down the main computer line. f3, of course, doesn't actually win the rook because rook h4 is check. So lastly, white could try to block with a queen. But obviously, there's a move everybody should see. This is a discover check against the queen. And now throw in another check using the pin. Notice the role of the knight, which is guarding the e3 square. And the queen is now lost. Okay, so this would have been... Uh, we would have been forced to find this if our opponent had come up with a more resilient rook g1. Um, after rook c4, the game is over. Any questions about this particular sequence that I just showed? I would say, well, what are, what are the lessons that we can extract? Well, rook c4 is a hard move to find. One thing you should notice is that when you're attacking, don't get the wrong impression from solving studies that every attacking move is glamorous. In fact, most attacking moves are business-like moves like rook c4 that open up new squares for your pieces. Um, so just appreciating the role of these quiet moves can really help you find them in your own games. It's elegant. It's This is chess beauty of a different kind. Um, no, I, it would possibly work if the knight was in another square, but f5 is an ideal location for the knight because it's controlling so many uh, of the white king's escape squares. And it's also acting as an anchor in case you need to take on h4 when the white king is on h3, the knight's defending that square as well. Okay, 
It also is stopping the queen check. And that, of course, speaks to the role of prophylaxis when you're attacking, which is a whole separate topic, which we'll address later. The last thing I want to address in this game is to talk briefly about white's more resilient move, which would have been queen to b1. And after queen to b1, I would have done the thing. Oh, oh my god. This is the perfect way to end this analysis. The end, I admit I didn't find this. My idea was to sack the exchange and go knight d4. And black is winning because the king is too weak. The engine spots a ridiculous combination. Watch this. You go knight to d4. Now, what seems to be the flaw inherent in playing knight d4 immediately? Who can spot, like, what, what is it that, why did we sack the exchange in the first place? Well, it's because we don't want to allow knight f6, right? And the problem is, if you move your king, this allows white to move their bishop. h5 is coming next. And it's a complicated position. Can anybody spot the hidden idea here? And this, the next move is just the tip of the iceberg. What are you supposed to do here? You sack the queen on f6, yes. Now you take the bishop. Now the king can't go to f1 because it gets checkmated easily. But the king goes up to g2. And now the creme de la, this is the coup de grace. This next move is freaking awesome. Who sees it? Rook g4, rook c4 to g4. You sack the knight. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call checkmate. Look at that. Look at that mating construction. You sack the knight in the end. Um, no, there's no way I would see that, even in a classical game. Probably not. I would have a chance if you gave me 30 minutes and you told me there was a tactic. Yeah, elementary, my dear Watson. Bishop a6 to e2, x-ray defending the rook. And if the king dashes the other way, then bishop c8. So the bishop goes either to e2 or to c8, back to its initial square, setting up unstoppable threat of checkmate. In fact, there is a way to stop it, which is to play rook h1 to c1. Now, a huge mistake would be this, because white takes the bishop. So here you calmly move the bishop away, and white has to give up the queen in order to prevent checkmate, and black is up a full knight, and the king is basically mated. So watch what the bishop does. It goes from a6. So it's just the whole arc of the attack is awesome. It goes from b7 to a6. It supports the rook, which goes to c4, which then goes to g4. And the bishop from a6 goes either back to c8 or to e2 with mate. Just the way that pieces work together in chess is so ridiculous. Incredible. Um, absolutely incredible. Anyways, not to like make too big of a deal of what what is a pretty normal combination, but it's crazy that it actually could have occurred in this game. I would have played rookie four though. There's no way I would have seen that. All right. Um, and on that note, folks, I think it's a good time for us to call it a day. Just to remind you, our opponent played queen a3. That allowed us to sack the exchange in a much more convincing version because well, here the king is wide open and it's getting attacked from all sides. And of course, rook g4 to c4 is uh, the key attacking move we would have had to see in the event of rook g1. By the way, rook h2, there's the simple move queen to f3 with unstoppable threats of knight e3 and knight g3, etc. Any questions, folks? Any questions about any part of this game? Of course, we're not analyzing the rest of the game here because it's very, very simple. Okay. Uh, rook g4 was best. My move was best. If you remember, during the game, I was a little bit undecided about whether to take first or to play rook g4. I correctly decided to throw in this check. And the main reason why is that the rook is now hanging. And the reason I decided to do this truly is because of this line where we have this check on b5. So driving the king to f1 was a great thing because of this additional mating pattern that takes the sting out of queen c8, queen c3. If we would have taken here first, then white would have been able to check and check. And compared to the position with the king on f1, apparently white has this move and white's still alive. Because now if you give the check, white can block with the rook. Remember that the knight is pinned. So there's never going to be a fork on e2. And it's minus three, but the game very much rook h4, king f1, rook h1, rook g1. White still holds on here. And technique is required. All right, guys, I'm going to have to wake up for breakfast uh, at 1030, so I'm going to call it a day here. 
I think for a log cabin speedrun game, this was good. Apologies for the tech problems. I think it'll be edited out in the YouTube video. But it's 4 a.m. I need to go to bed urgently. And I want to thank everybody who joined me on this cabin stream. Hope you guys have a great start to your week. And I will head to bed. I think the internet held up very nicely given where we are.